Spam worms hit Tumblr. A massive cluster cracks every standard Windows password in under six hours. Richard Stallman calls Ubuntu spyware. Struggles over internet governance continue in the ITU. And Facebook adds new privacy features while taking others away. All that and more this week on ThreatWire. Hello and welcome to ThreatWire. My name is Darren Kitchen. And I'm Shannon Morse. And this is the show where we cover your online privacy, security, and internet freedom. Yes, we do. And let's get right into it. We have tons to talk about. First off, Tumblr. Tumblr users may have experienced some spam messages on their feeds produced by an anti-blogging campaign by a group called the GNAA, which I am not going to spell out because I disagree, who believe that blogs have lowered the standards of journalism. The worm started on the brony tag. You heard of the bronies? No. They're the My Little Ponies and the bros. Put them together, you get bronies. I love the internet. I do too. So when a user would repost, repost content from that tag, they would get spam on their account and it grew from there. Tumblr has removed the spam from the GNAA worm, but BuzzFeed advised users to stay on the dashboard, don't follow any direct Tumblr links, and change their password. The Tumblr staff blog confirms that no accounts have been compromised and that you don't need to take any further action. But it is always a good practice to periodically change your password. Speaking of passwords, Jeremy Gosney, the CEO of Structure Consulting Group, recently showed off his latest password cracking rig at the Passwords 12 conference in Norway. And get this, this rig has 25 AMD graphics cards, which are able to bust out every possible eight character NTLM hash. And that's the password hash used by Windows. You get this Gosh. in about five and a half hours. So wow. for the most part, passwords aren't stored in a database in clear because then anybody with access to the database would have a password. So rather what's known as a one-way function is used. So for example, if my password were God love secret sex, it would be stored as a hash, a seemingly random bunch of letters and numbers. And then when I type my, num my password in, it runs it through the same hash function. And if what I typed in is what's stored, then go ahead and give me access. It's great. Now, it's called a one-way hash for a reason. The only way to know that the gibberish stored in the database actually translates to God love secret sex is to actually try every combination until you find a match. And attempting every possibility of eight characters, you know, like letters, numbers, and symbols, is seriously time consuming for yeah. the average computer. But not when you've got Gosney's rig using the open source Hashcat program and 25 graphics cards, it's able to make 350 billion guesses per second against the Windows hashing function. Now, the password cracking cluster puts a serious dent in hashes most commonly used to store passwords, and not just on Windows. It makes cracking attempts against other functions like SHA-1 or MD5 at around 63 billion and 180 billion attempts per second, respectively. So what does this mean to you? Well, if a website is storing your password with one of these weak functions and the password database is leaked, like what happened when six and a half million LinkedIn passwords uh, were leaked in June of this year, your password could be discovered in a matter of hours. Now, smart website operators are now using safer hash functions like bcrypt and, and SHA-512 crypt, and breaking those hashes takes about a million times longer. Unfortunately though, there's no way to know if the website operator is storing it with a weak hashing algorithm or something more advanced. Mm -hmm. So it's best practice to use a long passphrase, like 15 characters or more, and not to use the same one in every site, seriously. I might have to change my password on a couple of these sites. Now, Richard Stallman calls Ubuntu spyware because it tracks searches. Stallman, the president of the Free Software Foundation, wrote in a recent blog post calling Ubuntu spyware because it sends search data to Canonical. Stallman criticizes a new feature in Ubuntu's Unity in interface, which makes product recommendations from Amazon when you use the dash search. For example, if you type in calculator, you see both the application and calculators for sale on the retail giant. Now, the Electronic Frontier Foundation in, in October made a blog post underscoring the privacy invasiveness of this new feature while offering recommendations to disable it. Canonical, the makers of Ubuntu, said that they plan to expand the search function in the next version of the operating system. Oh, yay. <laughs> The upcoming Smart Scope feature will search more local and online sources. They're adding instant purchasing and including more retailers. Canonical still says that your privacy is important and none of the data transmitted will be user identifiable. They also say that users will know what data is collected through the dash and some data collection can be turned off in the settings. 
And get this, we have been closely following the developments leading up to the World Conference on International Telecommunications, that one held in Dubai by the United Nations ITU. Oh, yeah. And it's comprised of 178 nations who are all seeking to pass international regulations, which haven't been updated since 1988, which could totally redefine internet governance. And leaked documents from the closed door conference reveal that a proposal made by a bloc comprised of Russia, China, Saudi Arabia, Algeria, Sudan, Egypt, and the UAE state that, quote, internet governance shall be affected through the development and application by governments, meaning that each member state would have, quote, the sovereign right to establish and implement public policy, including international policy, on matters of internet governance. Now, this proposal was opposed by the United States and Canada and the European Union, and on Tuesday, Russia withdrew the proposal. But we're not out of the woods yet, and to be honest, I don't know if we ever were or will be. Numerous countries, most notably China, uh, with their great firewall, continue to repress the internet inside of their borders. And critics of internet, uh, of a government-controlled internet contend that legalizing this as a treaty uh, would basically uh, you know, justify those actions and that kind of behavior and possibly lead to further repression. Mm. Now, the conference ends on Friday, so here's us sending some good mojo to a free and open internet. So say we all. So say we all. Facebook says that they encouraged users to vote on the policy changes to their site, but that poll has ended with about 700,000 voting, which is a far cry from the needed 30% for them to actually take the votes into consideration. D did you ever say that actually I haven't encourage in in people to No do idea. No, not in my newsfeed. I don't know what they're talking about. I am not agreeing with this. Now, with all of this also come some changes to privacy controls. Again, Yay. a new privacy shortcut, their specific application permissions, which is nice, easier photo tag removal, and changes to the activity log. But they're also removing the who can look up my timeline by name function, meaning that if a person types your name into the search bar, they can see your whole timeline. Hopefully, the new privacy shortcuts will give users a new way to re-implement a similar timeline privacy function, but that's yet to be determined. You still have the option to change specific posts to private, though. So what do you do now? Votes don't matter, so you can either delete your account or you can take precautionary measures to stay on top of Facebook's ever-changing privacy policies so that you don't accidentally share more than you want. Or you realize that anything you put online could potentially be public anyway. So True. Anyway, before we go, I want to go ahead and award comment of the week to Aaron O from Google Plus, who wrote in regards to last week's show about the ITU versus a free and internet, uh, free and open internet, with quote, "Off to the dark net we go." In a way, this could be good for innovation, new methods of communications forced to be born, though obviously not the preferred way. Amen. The more, <laughs> the more you tighten your grips, the more star systems that are going to slip through your fingers. No. So if you have a comment or a thought on this week's show, feel free to uh, leave us a comment and be sure to find all of the ways to get involved with ThreatWire, including our new Google Plus community oh, nice. over at ThreatWire.org, where the conversation is ongoing. Ongoing. But last but not least, it's time for the holiday giveaway. TechFeed continues to spread cheer with daily giveaways of cool tech prizes. Today, ThreatWire will give one lucky viewer a new year full of streaming entertainment with a brand new Roku 2. To enter, let us know Veronica's verdict from this week's episode of Fact or Fictional. And with all of that, I'm Darren Kitchen. I'm Shannon Morris. We'll see you uh, on the internet. So say we all. Let's make this abundantly clear. Countries that like to repress their people and kick the snot out of them and monitor communications want to have their best practices made standard for the entire world. 